Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to those persons joining us on our Zoom and Facebook Live platforms to our show called Plain Talk, Education 2020 and Beyond, hosted by the Caribbean Visionary Educators. This is an opportunity for us to hear from and talk to individuals in the field of education and their views as we move through this COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. I am your host, Anderson Labari, with Dr. Freddie James as our moderator for this afternoon. Today's discussion focuses on reimagining education during this COVID-19 period and what could be done as we chart a path beyond this time. Now, we invite persons to share questions with us on our question and answer chat section below. Keep in mind that only questions posted in this area, as well as on our Facebook chat, will be answered. Questions will be answered intermittently by the members of the panel or the CVE team. We have an exciting panel lined up for today's session, comprising a mix of young and seasoned individuals in various spheres of the education system. So we go right into our discussion this afternoon, and we begin this afternoon with Dr. Vanus James. Dr. Vanus James is an economist, and good afternoon, Dr. James. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Good to have you here with us this afternoon. And we start our discussions right away. And I would like you to share with us, uh, how can we uh, in the region chart a way for educators during this time, especially this COVID-19 period? For educators or for the education system? For the education system. Right, well, what we have to confront isn't particularly restricted to the challenges posed by COVID. <clears throat> These countries, the Caribbean countries, and in particular Trinidad and Tobago in our case, have still uh, confronting us a fundamental development problem. We have a lot of uh, our people employed in low productivity activities. And we have to deal with that. Underemployment, as we say, we have to fix that problem. And to fix that, we have to restructure our economy. Uh, everybody hears a lot about that in the media from time to time. And uh, in order to do that, we have to grow our capacity to compete. Now, in order to achieve that, the country has to pivot to a particular set of industries, industries that produce and trade by using knowledge and skills and appropriate favorable worker attitudes. The, the particular industries that are, uh, would come to mind here would be education, healthcare, what you know as the creative industries that thrive by innovation, sports, and what I like to call an industrialized tourism, which is a blend of all those that I just listed there. Now, the education system that we have in our, in our um, in societies all across the region is not fit to create a, a competitive society, and it has to be updated. And there are four things I think we should do in order to update this system that we've inherited from the colonial past. The first is that we have to rebalance and reconfigure the education system we are working with now to build this competitive capacity. Uh, uh, and competitive capacity is, is built. Competition itself is a process of continuous piecewise, as we say in mathematics, technical, uh, an institutional innovation. You have to build an education system to drive that process. Uh, in order to do that, you need to fix the curricula and the teaching methods that would produce a competing graduate, a, a confident, self-confident graduate, a person who Mali would say would be free from mental slavery so that they would be equipped to implement a modern competitive strategy. Uh, you then need to have measures, if that is to work, you're going to need, need measures introduced into the education system to deal with the historical uh, inequality and poverty that have such a big bearing on the quality of education outcomes, learning outcomes in our system. Every one of you who are teachers would know 
that extra lessons is our quality control, but vast numbers of students can't afford high quality extra lessons in order to excel in O levels and D levels. You have to fix that problem, along with problems going to uh, hunger, dyslexia, and a whole series of in inhibitions to learning. And then you have to um, add a strong comp export, competitive export component dimension to the tertiary level of our education so that what you are doing in UWI and UTT, which is focused on the local uh, market or, 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 or UTEC and UWI in Mona or Kville, all focused on the domestic markets for the most part, that needs to be radically reformed so you could add a tertiary export component to boost quality and boost the ability of the education system itself to drive foreign exchange earnings for the country. Let me um, tell you a couple of things quickly about how you have to rebalance and reconfigure. The critical problem that you are fixing when you talk about an unbalanced education system in the region is that of a system that is focused on what we call the academic track. All over the region, the data shows you that somewhere in the region of about 30 to 35% of the students do well in a system that was designed for everybody to pass exams. So that the last time I surveyed the Jamaica labor market, 60% of the persons in the labor market had passed nothing. That's because the system is rigged up around what you call this academic track. And that's designed to facilitate success and to treat with persons who are interested in a very narrow range of careers, public service, law, medicine, engineering, the social sciences, accounting. The critical professions that are arising in the modern economy that generate high income are not served, right? Uh, what you have to do now is reform this system that we have, to add a track that would cater for professional interests in those high income uh, careers like sports, the carnival industries of music and entertainment that Marshall Montano and those people are uh, excelling in, Beanie Man and Bounty Killer, Bob Marley in Jamaica and so on, Sparrow, that sort of stuff. The arts and cultural activity, we need a track to treat with that along with things like fashion. And of course we need a specialized track especially in the context of a place like Tobago, to treat with industrialized tourism. Industrialized tourism is tourism of the kind that would base its, its development on export of education, export of healthcare, export of the, uh, the creative industries, and so on, that sort of stuff. And this track should also service your engineering arts, uh, and related professions like the mechanical fitters and the construction workers, the electricians and so on. Full track, what we would think of as tech work education in the old days, there needs to be a full track parallel to and running for the entire period of lifelong learning from preschool all the way to tertiary education, allowing people to pursue careers properly in those in those uh, high income areas. Uh, as you, many of you would know, you could be a highly qualified economist and you can't make as much money as a, as a highly uh, skilled football player. So we need to reconfigure and cater properly for that track. Now, um, <clears throat> you need that to be running all the way from early childhood where the selection processes begin all the way through to tertiary, uh, tertiary education. That's the kind of education system you would find in a place like Finland. When you do the reform along those tracks, those two kinds of tracks, you have to treat with the fact that um, you have to focus the education system on building performance quality uh, for the average student coming out of school. So this, the system that we have today uh, tends to produce students who don't really need the teachers. For the most part, the vast majority of the, the, 
highly uh, skilled and high performance students in the academic track are so intelligent. They really go to school. Any school they go to, they, they would do well. And they really don't need the teachers. Uh, I, I don't, I recall when I went to school, I didn't need any of these secondary school teachers I had. I could pass my exams on my own. That sort of stuff you can give to the average student. So you have to have a system that is good because it could help the average student or below average student uh, perform well in the system. And, um, and if you make that kind of reform, you will then tend to find that 80, 90% of the persons passing through the school system would all do very well. That's the first thing that we have to fix. Secondly, we have to fix the curriculum and the pedagogy, the methods of teaching to produce a self-confident graduate, a person who is free to innovate and think, uh, and you have to, um, to remove the inhibitions to thinking, to free-spirited thinking through the way you reform the curriculum and reform the pedagogy in particular. Uh, a big part of that we will find across the region is that a lot of the mental slavery that our children have to deal with come from the authoritarianism in the system, built in to the homes, into the schools and so on. And they all fundamentally come from the way the political system works. So you would need to work. So you would need to fix that and teach children how to fix that as part of the business of giving them a chance to free their minds. Uh, you have to deal with the issues of poverty. In research that I'm currently doing in Jamaica, we find that when we help children with the psychological needs that they come to the system with and with their ability to cope with food and clothing and sports gear and um, extra lessons funding and so on, they tend to perform at the top levels of their classes. When they don't get that kind of support, they underperform. So we need to treat with that. That is all about uh, fixing the disadvantaged households and the ability to take advantage of the systems we're talking about there and disadvantaged communities like Laventil and so on. And then finally, there is the cross-cutting issue that um, the Caribbean countries need to treat with. And that is the matter of teacher quality. If you want to have a high performing education system, the top profession in the country has to be teaching. As in a place like Philly, the best paid people are, are, are the teachers and the, therefore the system is able to attract the most competent people into education and teaching as a profession. And if you could do that and wrap the export orientation around that, you have a chance to reform the education system to support the development process. Wow. Thank you very much, Dr. James. I appreciate especially th that those four points that you brought up with regards to the whole idea of the idea of rebalancing, fixing our curricula at this point in time, um, and the focus on the historical inequalities that we have had over, I can't even say a few, a few years, over the decades. All oh, right. Oh, yes, exactly. As well as especially focusing on the creative arts um, component. And I wanted to say thank you very much for those because I think it was very, very valuable and for persons. And we have, I know we have a few questions on those, but we'll hold all the questions for the end of the first four um, contributors this afternoon. And, you know, especially on the creative arts um, component, I want to kind of delve a little more in that. So thank you very, very much, Dr. James. And I will ask Amanda just to share our thoughts with regards to that in terms of the creative arts and what could the creative arts in our region do to harness the benefits? Sorry, I should say, um, how could the education system harness the benefits of the creative arts system in our region, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic? So Amanda, I give you the platform at this point in time. Yes, thank you and good evening, everybody. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. James. Uh, well, I had a, a look anticipating this kind of uh, this kind of question at some of the things I had been tracking, being an avid social media follower myself. And of course, during the pandemic, everyone would have uh, retreated or diverted a lot of their energy 
uh, to the to the online forum. Uh, and uh, just I just want to share with you four examples of the ways in which uh, artists, uh, creativists, as people like to use this term now, uh, arts entrepreneurs, some of the ways in which people have used their time and their energy, their talent, uh, to share some of what is there inside of them that they naturally would want to share uh, in a context now where we have to social distance, where we, where we can't meet face to face or congregate in theaters or bars and so on, uh, natural spaces for, uh, for art and, and entertainment. The first uh, example I wanted to share is how a young creative entrepreneur uh, was able to take her online forum to a slightly different place than where it had been before in terms of creating a very useful, well-structured uh, educational resource. And that is, I'm referring to the work of a young lady called Janelle Mitchell. Uh, Janelle has something called Theater Convos, which happen in the Facebook space online. I'm going to try to share an image, a screenshot uh, right now for you. And I hope everybody can see this. Theater Convos on Facebook. Okay? And now Janelle's Theater Convos with her uh, MA in Arts Entrepreneurship, that started ever since January. Uh, but certainly once the lockdown came around, uh, Janelle started to uh, do more interviews and with not simply the younger generation of artists who she had been featuring since uh, January to have these modern contemporary discussions around art and, and uh, theater making. Uh, but she started now to interview some of the elders or some of the more established artists in our society. Uh, so she would have taken time then from June, so months past January, uh, to talk to people like Michelle Cox, who is at uh, Barbados Community College running the program in theater arts there, Michelle's passion for Caribbean theater. Uh, she talked about the tech life with Peter, which would be Peter Lewis, uh, who runs a tech company here. Uh, she would have talked with Carla Springer Hunt, who was the manager of the Arobara Center for Creative Imagination, right where I'm sitting right now here at university. She would have talked with Winston Farrell, the rhythm poet, elder, and uh, she would have recently talked also with Peter Linda Ali, one of the founder members of, uh, of Laugh It Off, the oldest running satirical review in Barbados. Uh, you would see also that Janelle is currently promoting body space masterclass with Sonia Williams. Uh, Sonia Williams, of course, a well-known regional theater artist. And this there is promoting Sonia's developed uh, technique and development, uh, which focuses on embodied arts practice. Now, Janelle comes out of the University of the West Indies Cape Hill, right here, our bar center, has a master's in arts entrepreneurship, and she's founded uh, the Smart Arts Room, and she considers herself a Barbadian creativist. I, I thought that, I, I thought it was so wonderful how she expanded uh, the scope of, her, of the work of the theater combos uh, to collect and compile reminiscences from the elders so that now we have a resource that students can resort to all across the region who are interested in, uh, who are studying theater arts and who would need to access those resources for their classes. Uh, the second one I wanted to, to talk about, uh, again, uh, how people respond to the pandemic is the work of the same rhythm poet, uh, Winston Farrell. Now, Winston Farrell is no stranger in, uh, to anyone in, in the Caribbean, I should think. He's an award-winning playwright, poet, actor. And um, uh, he also, and his work found itself moving, uh, not simply in the tradi traditional political consciousness that he'd always been operating in, but, well, we can think of what happened on February 25th. And you can imagine how that would have galvanized him into the creation of, of art that stands in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement um, following the killing of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police in the United States of America. And Winston took to Facebook. And again, I want to stress postgraduate educated and MA in theater for development from Leeds University. 
And he took to Facebook with a lot of the work that he had been uh, mulling on. I saw him at one of our protest marches in Barbados and he said his, his mind was just working over time and, and that the poetry was coming fast and furious uh, so that uh, he found himself now needing a space to perform and, and took it all, all to Facebook. And uh, Mr. Farrell uh, launched his, again, I'm gonna share with you on 4 p.m. Saturday, his COVID corner. Uh, uh, now he rebranded himself slightly, readings with the poet I. Farrell to show that sort of uh, leading into the virtual space and began to share some of his newer work, Just Us and Them, uh, No Jesus, No Justice, uh, but also with readings from Barbadian uh, canonical writers, Kamau, uh, Bruce St. John, and so on. Launched new music, I Cry, new poetry, Nelson's Last Stand. We also took time in Barbados uh, to raise that issue as well, given the whole scope of uh, statues falling in the, in the world. And recently, we found our protests are bearing fruit. Nelson will come down before the end of the emancipation season. Winston launched Knife to the Windpipe. We're talking about new poetry, huh? Taken to the Knee, eight minutes and 46 seconds. And then new rhythm poetry. In other words, music, uh, uh, poetry accompanied by music. Uh, Farrell would also have done a little extra in that I've seen him doing something recently that I hadn't noticed before, uh, gone into the whole business of merchandising, conscious of course that the virtual world offers him a much larger audience than he would traditionally have had in the small bars or entertainment spaces um, here in Barbados. So you see there again, uh, the mask, the t-shirts, just us and them. Note how the colors also, um, coincide the black and white with the Black Lives Movement. Uh, so artists are responding in very real ways uh, to, to the way that the pandemic uh, has forced them to shift their work, their thoughts, uh, their ways of marketing, et cetera, online. Uh, quickly, the third one I wanted to just show as a hard example um, is uh, the work of Don Lisa Callender Smith, who is, uh, a musical theater practitioner studied at Boston Conservatory. And uh, Don Lisa found herself taking what she would traditionally have done, which would be to conduct heritage tours for tourists. Now, mind you, of course, Barbados is a major tourist destination, and much of our arts work uh, is channeled through, uh, in terms of revenue stream and income earning, through, through the whole structure of tourism. Uh, so Don Lisa would have taken her heritage tour, storytelling uh, work at, online and translated it to a whole different context. Now here is an image of Don Lisa uh, that would have been posted on our Ministry of Creative Economy, Culture and Sports, uh, Meta Heritage Entrepreneur. Yes? And you would note uh, Don Lisa is down there on the bottom left of the screen as uh, she's dressed uh, like a typical a colorful a hawker, huckster, but also it has the air of the Mother Sally masquerade uh, featured in the costuming and the shape and so on. Um, you see she conducts walking tours. Now these would have stopped during the pandemic, during the lockdown, but the, the nature of the tour, which allows for social distancing and so on, meant that as soon as the lockdown was over, Don Lisa was able to restart. Uh, and she's offering now to a local market and not just to a tourist market. But interestingly, uh, she took to the Facebook, to the online arena uh, to do something that brought a lot of relief and consolation to a lot of our public. Story time with Auntie D. Now, Don Lisa, Don Lisa was able to, to collate her interest in her African heritage in, her, in the Caribbean uh, uh, heritage of stories and focus um, mostly on Aesop's fables and Anansi tales. She also took time to share stories from other cultures, but again, uh, perhaps influenced or further motivated by the rising tide of Black Lives Matter, uh, 
you find artists beginning to articulate very strongly a sense of cultural identity of African awareness and heritage. And so you saw that there coming out in her work. She took, uh, so she's taken the live performance, but she's taken it on, online, on stream to a different wider audience of audience of spectators and has created over the course of that page, a huge resource of life storytelling that can be accessed by uh, mummies, daddies, whoever reads stories to their children. And she's got a wonderful hashtag, hashtag reading with mummy. Uh, so we know it's also for daddies also. And finally, I wanted to just to share uh, what iWeb and Shane Jones of Water Street Boys created um, in the making of their Caribbean medley uh, we got this one song and they this song uh, features artists from right across the region um, uh, marketed as one message 14 countries 26 artists including Queen B from Antigua, Marsville from Barbados, Claudette Peters from Antigua, Motto from St. Lucia. And it's again a response to COVID lockdowns effect on the music industry across the region and, and in particular on the performing artists. Now, I myself, I'm not 100% certain how they may monetize this particular song, but in terms of what artists do, it does try to offer some sort of shall I say, consolation or, or support, you know, the whole idea that we're all in one boat together um, and, and we know how hard artists um, were treated um, by the effects of the lockdown. And so there's just one part of the image um, from uh, the online music video that they were able to create. So just to quickly wrap up, I just wanted to give four cases um, uh, to, sh to show some of the ways Barbadian artists were responding to the pandemic and the way that they took their product online allowed for opening to a wider virtual market and um, certainly created conditions for the furthering of this kind of work uh, for the future. And then something I also noted was how uh, in response to the burgeoning or resurgence of, of, of Black Lives Matter, uh, and, and uh, the, the African heritage and consciousness, you found artists uh, clearly articulating these things more to a wider uh, audience than you might have seen in previous times um, before a uh, pandemic. And I thought that this bodes very well uh, for the future of art. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kamabach. I know you made mention of, you know, that's what happens in Barbados, but. Um, I hope you permit me to also say that it happens throughout the Caribbean as well. All right, I'm seeing it happening in the various islands. I know in Trinidad and Tobago, it's happening at this point in time. I have been seeing it happening in, in Guyana, in St. Lucia, and these other islands or regions where persons are really trying to, to redevelop themselves, redirect themselves, rebrand themselves, all right, in terms of ensuring that there is some level of sustainability as they move forward into 2020 and beyond. I don't think many of us would have ever predicted this is how 2020 would have been. All right, so thank you very much again, Ms. Kamabach. So I'm shifting a little bit from the creative arts a little bit, and I just want to listen to the perspective from a student. And I invite uh, Ms. Asso, Ms. Jai Asso, um, a student of the Holy Faith Convent, Hoover, an A-level student from Trinidad and Tobago, to share her views on the education system. And Ms. Asso, uh, based on your experiences with online learning, what would you recommend as a useful approach for teaching and learning during this period? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I think for this period, teachers should try to have um, structure within online learning because it's easy for students to get distracted when um, structure is not there. For example, um, me personally, I'm an upper six. So by the time it was time, by the time exams were confirmed for July, um, 
there wasn't much time to really teach anything. Nothing else really needed to be taught. Um, and there was no real structure, which was an issue for a lot of schools. A lot of schools were trying to bring in structure, but there wasn't anything solid in place. So I think for this time, there should be structure so that students don't get lazy, they don't get um, cold. Um, within COVID-19, however, COVID-19 to me personally has revolutionized education. There are pros and cons, of course. Um, in a way, it has made it safer for students to learn because we have to understand that some students go to school and experience bullying for various things. So in a way, it's safer for them. Um, although, uh, also, sorry, a lot of students are more comfortable learning at home and they are able to do more when they learn at home and they're able to do better when they are in a non-competitive environment. You know, a lot of times in schools, everybody is competing against each other, but in the comfort of your home, you work at your own pace, you do assignments at your own pace. Um, also, in terms of teachers, a lot more work could be covered as you know, a lot of times in school, you have staff meeting and then you have to break for lunch, you have to break for snack. Um, however, at home, the teacher can teach a distraction free class and students are able to, okay, if you eat and you're on your phone, you can carry your phone with you to the kitchen while you're listening to Miss, you're making something to eat. So there's that. The cons of um, the COVID-19 and education is, socialization between peers is harder. Um, peer interaction, I think, is very important within classrooms. Sometimes you don't understand something when the teacher says it. Um, however, when your friend explains it to you, you understand it better. But that's kind of harder to do when you're not in a classroom setting. And some may argue that there's social media, but social media is really not the same as face-to-face interaction, in my opinion. Um, integrity of major examinations can also be questioned. Things like, well, at the tertiary level, at least, um, a lot of times you're not sure how valid or how reliable the person who doing the exam, how much, how much validity it has, because there are persons who, you know, can cheat, you know, you can message your friend, hey, where's the answer for this? And nobody will really know if you pass the exam based on your own merit or based on somebody else's knowledge. Um, and as I mentioned before, a lack of structure within the system can encourage laziness among students. Like if my teacher tells me, okay, your classes begin at 10 and I reach at 10 and half 10, nobody is there, 11, I will just leave and I might sleep the rest of the day. Or if classes start at 12, some students, that's a little too late for them, you know, and you have to have a kind of structure, make a timetable within the online so that students are able to have a structure and learn effectively. Um, I expect that the education system takes students into consideration because as we saw with the lockdown of schools, a lot of major examinations had to be pushed back. Um, but in my opinion, again, a lot of students weren't asked, asked their opinions based on what should happen. It was really a lot of the older heads or the presidents saying, okay, students are frustrated. They want the exam now, but they didn't ask students. Or even if they asked students, they asked one student, which, that, and that one student, her view would not be the views of the entire Caribbean. You can't take one student from one country and expect her to know how every single student in the Caribbean is feeling about this exam. Um, also, with, with the pushing back of exams, the lack of certainty, the um, running around created um, created confusion within students. And that also con um, contributed to frustration and procrastination because personally, not knowing when the exam is going to be, you don't know if you have two weeks to study three modules, you don't know if you have two months to study three modules, 
you know, um, so it creates cre confusion and frustration among students. And this can affect mental health, which in turn affects students' results from examinations. I know a lot of people question the integrity also of the only multiple choice. Um, I, I think that with students' frustration, the multiple choice alone was a very good idea. But however, there were a lot of people saying that, oh, these students don't think that's a good idea. When in fact, we thought it was a perfect idea. Well, a lot of us thought it was a perfect idea as we, we were able to, you know, lay back and take our times and study for the examinations. And in fact, the multiple choice tests each, met the, each module for at least for CAPE, the multiple choice is able to test the entire syllabus, whereby the paper too, a lot of times only tests certain questions. And so we students can form a pattern, which, which topic is going to come. So um, the multiple choice is really more all-rounded. Um, so yeah, I think that the education system maybe put a lot more focus on these students because even for SEA, right now, a lot of students are frustrated um, as they have been preparing since probably April for this examination. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Asso. And uh, you know, you, you made mention of the whole idea of the, the student's voice and that one person cannot speak for the entire Caribbean, which is, which is really unfortunate that our leaders don't pay attention to that and that we need to look at the whole picture and not just in isolation and, one, and pockets and things like that. Uh, I want to say thank you very much for your contributions. All right. And we do have a few questions coming in. And rest assured, right, at, um, right after Mr. Dawson, then you would um, entertain the some questions at this point in time. So I want to kind of move, con continuing with the students, and I invite Mr. Du Mr. Dawson, sorry, Mr. Dawson at this point in time. All right, so Mr. Dawson, I give you the platform. Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Today I'll be speaking about education in the Caribbean 2020 and beyond. And um, I'll go beyond the, U the University of the West Indies and just talk about tertiary institution on a whole. Um, over the past days, I saw this post over the UA Open Campus on Facebook page and it, it grabbed my attention. And um, this post had a quote. And that is the quote. And for me, that, that quote, which was um, which is written by American writer Alvin Toffler uh, in a book named The Future Shock, Shock um, which was published in 1970, says um, the illiterate, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn and un un learn, unlearn and relearn. And what this, this quote is speaking volumes towards our education system and the current situation that we are in. What the pandemic has shown us is the fragility of traditional learning. And for me, an online student at U UB Open Campus, while um, this pandemic was spreading through the, uh, the Caribbean, like a wildfire. The UA Open Campus, we it took us about two days to switch fully on to online and um in, implement an alternate assessment instead of a face-to-face -face exam. And um that made me realize that while the economy is rather standstill, school were closed, countries closed, the U the UA Open Campus was was still operating and still serving us. And that made me realize that the, the that the key for us to safeguard education, tertiary education um, in the Caribbean is to forego the traditional learning and embrace technology and move into online education. And for this, we need to learn the, the, um, the online environment, not only learn the online environment, but we must unlearn the traditional environment of tertiary education and relearn um, the art of adoption as we try to fit into the new normality um, of post COVID-19 um, in, in, in our tertiary online education. This, I don't expect this to be an easy process. Um, first, we have to learn the online education. And we will do this by uh, online training seminars for educational institution managers, lecturers, and students. Training seminars to equip educational institution administration on how to run an online institution. It's not the same as running a physical campus. So they need to be, um, you know, 
given a knowledge about servers, online portal access and management, and a portal that is safe, that is a safe and secure platform for storing student data and for also um, storing staff data. Training seminars to equip educators and lecturers with the proficient knowledge to carry out online lecturing and um, tutoring and doing so with maintaining the educational institution's um, credibility. Because with online learning, many people question the credibility of it because it's online, but it's up to the lecturers and tutors to, to um, bring across the material in a manner where students, where, where it will where it will have the same impact as if we were in a traditional setting. And lastly, it's training the students, training the students to navigate um, the online platforms and to properly use the right, right techn technological equipment. I mean, the online process, it's, it's not difficult, but it's not easy either. So with the right training, it will be quite simple for students. Um, the second step will be on learning the traditional environment of tertiary education. And this is where things get a bit difficult. I mean, we have been practicing traditional education for centuries. Um, so moving away from face-to-face -face lecture well, would be difficult, but in, at this time, it is the safest thing to do. Imagine the pandemic, you know, it, it, it goes away for a while and we, are, we have adjusted and then go back to traditional learning and then something else comes up. Then students' education are, you know, put at a disadvantage again. So we must move away from face-to-face -face lecture, limit the use of classrooms. Um, no more passive learning. And, and, and that is with, with traditional learning, passive learning is, you know, you, you sit in a classroom and you hear what the lecturer is saying. In an online tertiary environment, while the teacher is lecturing, maybe it's showing you how to do one method, you can be there researching a method that works for you. So moving away from passive learning, um, less social interaction at tertiary level, less physical social interactions, let me add that. And what, 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 what COVID-19 has brought about is, is that we don't have to be at work to really work. We can be at home and work. So more, so less physical in, physical interaction, but more online interaction. So what the what the online education will do is give us the necessary tools for us to interact online, um, socially, so that we can you know maneuver to whatever it's work and school, and also let, less need to travel to um, to a ter tertiary um, to a tertiary education for traditional learning. I'm in Belize, there, there's no need for me to travel to Mona, Jamaica, Cape Barbados, or St. Douglas Engineering, that when I could do the open campus online and attain a credible degree. And uh, the, the third point is relearning the art of adoption. We must adapt the flexibility to pursuing an online education. This means adapting, um, adapting the, the, the skills to balance work and school or the online education. It's not easy and it comes with a lot of self-discipline and self-motivation, as, as I will mention later on. And um, the second is adapting technological experience. We need to adapt technology and incorporate it into our lives because after COVID-19, that will be our new lives. We'll, we'll have a more deeper connection with technology because it's the, it's the thing that got us through COVID-19. Um, ad adapting to the new cost of online education, it is not as costly as traditional education. Um, You'll need to adapt self-discipline, self-motivation. And these are some, some things that will be a disadvantage for some students at first, but eventually they will adjust. I mean, when I first became an online student, it was difficult. I mean, you, you don't have a, you don't see your lecture every day and you don't have to go to class every day. It's up to you to take that initiative and, and to have that self-discipline to, um, to enter your online class every day. And the last one is adopting the realization that online education, um, it is safeguarded through unprecedented events such as natural disasters and pandemic. No matter what happens, you have your online education. Um, and I could speak from experience for that. I've been through hurricanes and no pandemic and my online education is still happening and it is still going great. Challenges of us adapting the, on to online education, the online education system for 2020 and beyond would be and enrollment rate might decline uh, because students may not want to, you know, do their education online. Adjusting to online education may be difficult. Like I said, you need that self-motivation and self-discipline to get your work done. And um, practical education will, will be challenged. Practical education, such as those who are studying medicine, engineering, that, that, that need that practical approach. Students like that will still have to continue traditional um, education. And the change in social development in students are um, one thing that traditional education has provided is 
a level of social development and growth in students. Um, it, 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 for me, it's not mandatory at a tertiary level, but at a primary and secondary level, I think having that physical interaction with, with people it, it is good for personal growth. So th that will be one challenge after, educate, after the online education system for 2020 and beyond. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Dawson. We appreciate your, your presentation this afternoon. All right, um, just to quickly uh, mention, you, you spoke about the whole idea of moving away from the traditional, you know, the whole idea of uh, adopt, uh, adopting technology, okay? And, and you know, moving up from the face-to-face. -face. Uh, what I would say also, probably we may have to start looking or exploring the whole idea of blending learning. All right. Um, just to quickly recap a few of the other points that came up this afternoon from our first four panelists. We did have the whole idea of speaking for components with regards to the whole idea of rebranding and restructuring our, our system, which restructuring our economy and focusing on the creative industries. Uh, we had the, the points talking, speaking about the whole idea of the importance of the student input which I think is ever so valuable throughout the Caribbean and not only just one or two persons speaking about it. The idea of using other platforms and, the, and, and what, what, especially the creative industries, what they're using to, um, to rebrand and redirect themselves into new, into new ways and new styles and new formats. All right. And of course, uh, Mr. Dawson, he spoke the whole idea of adapting to our technology, which thanks to COVID-19, many of us throughout the world um, have been doing at this point in time. All right, so uh, what I will do is that we would entertain a few questions right now, and I would invite um, our moderator for this afternoon, Dr. Freddie James, to lead that part of this, uh, uh, this, uh, this discussion. So Freddie. Thank you, thank you very much, Anderson. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. I do have a few questions that have been coming in. And I would really like to delve right into our question and answer segment. Our first question will go to Dr. Vanus James. An anonymous um, participant said, your ideas are really welcoming. Why are we not using these ideas to reform the education system? We have so many brilliant individuals with ideas to reform but it seems to be taking time. I am an educator and want to contribute towards reforming our education system to meet the needs of minds of our nation. How do we move forward? And in the same vein, I have a second question that came in for Dr. James that asks about how do we chart a way forward where students learn again to rely on their own intelligence and not on lessons and regain self-belief beyond grades in a system that focuses largely on exam performance. This question comes from Joanne, who says that, thank you for a brilliant discourse, Dr. James. I relate very much with your point about student independence and confidence. So I turn over to Dr. Vanas James to respond to those questions, please. You have to unmute your mic, Dr. James. Can somebody unmute Dr. James's mic, please? Yeah, you hearing me now? Yes, we are, thanks. Right. Um, well, in a way, the best place to start is to answer the second first. And that is to point to the critical role of high quality teachers in the uh, process of education. What we have done in the Caribbean spaces, we've really made 
teaching the bottom rung of the professions. So 60, 70% of the teachers are not the scholarship winners and the, the top of the line scholars in the system. Uh, you really need to have an education system in which the teachers are your best scholars. And then on top of that, you need to have an education system in which you don't get to teach in the system unless you are so well qualified, like master's degree, you're involved in research, you're publishing your teaching materials, and so on. If you have that kind of teacher, the interaction between the teacher and the student becomes highly creative. And a, a confident teacher like that could facilitate a student who is curious and challenging and able to uh, grasp material in a creative way and, and think for themselves. So in an important sense, the fundamental answer there is to fix the, the teaching profession itself to provide a fresh foundation on which um, the interface between teachers and students would occur. Uh, content would matter, would change. Uh, the creativity of the teaching process itself would change and we will generate a different type of student learning process out of that. On the, on the first question as to why we don't bring ourselves into the modern world where we create an education system that could equip us to compete successfully in the whole global system. Ultimately, I think the evidence shows that you have to change the political system in order to make this kind of change. Because it really is not just the education system that is lagging. You know? the, remember, the whole economy is lagging. The political system is one in which um, we are still running these authoritarian structures even though you hear everybody calling for your knee to be taken off my neck and stuff like that. Uh, mental slavery has to go. We've been singing about that since Bob Marley's days and so on. All of those things uh, simultaneously with us and we have a society that has been reticent in confronting them. In order to get that to change, in a kind of way we have to get the political system changed so that all of us could be in the conversation about what we ought to do. And we have a chance to regulate the behavior of the executive branch in our societies. And then we would drive the, 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 the change. And only when we do that, I think, we will be able to put in place this kind of education reform alongside the other reforms we need in the economy as a whole. I could just end by telling you, as an economist, I lament the, the absence of uh, economic restructuring and uh, repositioning ourselves with a fresh competitive strategy. And I, and I lament that just as much as I lament that the education system is not being retrofitted to equip us to do that kind of work. But none of those kinds of changes will take place unless we bring, give ourselves the political will, and that means political reform, and in the end, uh, uh, governance reform to the creation of an inclusive governance model in the system. Thank you very much, Dr. James, for those insightful responses. And uh, there's a lot that we can learn from uh, what you've said in terms of the transforming of the education system and empowering the practitioners to create the, the groundswell we need to have change in the system. So um, I'm gathering that our practitioners and our educators out there who are listening are taking note that the change really will have to start with us. The next question comes from Commentator Campbell, a principal of the Charles Hubert James Primary School in Kew, North Caicos. She says, we are anticipating the reopening of our elementary school with children between the age of four to 11 years old. How do we get the students to maintain social, social distancing once we reopen school and schools? And I would like to throw this question out to Jahia because all over the Caribbean, all over the world, as a matter of fact, people are grappling with this question. 
So I'd like to ask Jahia to come in now and share your thoughts on this question with us. I think it's important to really teach children, especially between those ages, the importance of maintaining social distancing and how serious the matter is. Because children by nature are very, very playful. So they'll hear about a situation and they'll cough on you as a game, not knowing whether or not they have the virus, you know, whether or not their parent brought it home. They don't really know the dangers because it's being taught in a way that adults and maybe even teenagers understand. But little children, the most they know about it is, okay, coronavirus is here and we have to wash our hands. And they told us to stay away from our friends, but we really don't know why. So you need to teach it in a way, maybe with colorful posters, um, things that attract children for them to truly understand the importance of staying away from each other and not helping to spread the virus. Thank you very much, Jahia, for offering some ideas because I think we are all looking for creative ways to stop these children from just running and hugging up each other when they see each other when school reopens. Uh, the next question I would like to throw out to uh, Ms. Kamalbach. Someone asked, how do I get the child to stay, to stay focused when using the online platform? Well, that, thank you for the question. I think to a large degree, the, the active participation of an adult is one thing that makes uh, su for successful uh, online participation for a young child. Um, I myself am a parent with a very small one and a, and a 16 year old. And I have observed uh, the 16 year old going through the CFC preparation um, through the online and, and there's so much that young Miss Athan has said that I was there is sort of quietly nodding on the inside um, in terms of her critique about the effectiveness of, of, how the, of the system itself. I think uh, uh, parent engagement is key, critical. I noted over the course of the period, period that uh, uh, there were a lot of frustrated parents um, complaining all over social media about it. And also the funny comments from teachers who were now, uh, who were now uh, glad that parents were seeing what it was like. <laughs> um, and, uh, that sort of thing makes a difference. When you have an adult uh, actively engaged, the teacher is forced to uh, handle the business quite differently as uh, showing up late, for instance, or not being fully prepared for the lesson is mitigated somewhat by knowing that there is an adult lurking somewhere in the background. Um, especially also for younger children. To keep them uh, engaged, um, what I observe myself in practice, the shorter sessions, the sessions that had much more of a breakup in terms of the screen usage and presentation, and then certainly uh, sessions that offered lots of discussion, um, which interestingly um, was much, which seemed much freer and open amongst the youngsters once they were behind the screen rather than face to face with each other and, and the teacher. I think those things also make for more effectiveness. I actually had to ask my 16 year old, is that how you talk to the teachers uh, in class? Uh, because they were quite free in the way that they were speaking uh, to each other and to the teachers, but it did open up some uh, very lively, um, perhaps deeper discussions than they might otherwise have had in the traditional classroom setting. Thank you very much, Ms. Kambach, for that, that response and, and, you know, drawing from your own reality with your own children and the seeing, um, I suppose, the role that, that parents would have to play going forward, we, we, we see how the dynamic will change as with the online platform, that the role of parenting may change and we will find out more of that later on. 
But for now, I want to throw a question to Mr. Dawson, Leon Dawson. Physical distancing has become the norm in our schools and today as a result of COVID-19. How do you see this impact in social development, which is so crucial to the development of our students? This question comes from Dr. Sylvia Henry from Barbados. And I know you touched a bit in your presentation on social development. So Leon, can you share a bit more with us by answering this question, please? Um, sure. The thing with social development, uh, from my perspective, it is important that students at primary and secondary level have, you know, uh, interaction with, with, with each other. So, so social development is key when you're between five and say 17 years old. And the current pandemic, it, it, it will have an effect on social development for, for, for kids, you know, the, between the, these age, I mean, kids and youth between these age. However, the thing with, with the thing with, her, with, with the human body, it, it's homostasis, we adapt. And if social distancing is something that we can, that we have to maintain, or our body will eventually figure out a way to, you know, to incorporate social development skills from a distance. At first, it will it will be difficult, and 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 you will see direct impacts. But over or, over a period of time, you will see our body adjusting, and our you know, or or social development skills will 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 still be honed and developed. Thank you very much, Mr. Dawson. And now we will end this first question and answer segment. I'm going to throw it back to our host, Mr. Anderson Labari, to engage us in the second section of our panel discussion. Thank Please you very much. Put your questions up in the Q&A section. Thank you very much, Dr. James. I do appreciate it. And thank you very much to those panelists. We invite uh, Mr. Roberts at this point in time for his presentation. So Mr. Roberts, you do have the platform right now. All right, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> First of all, let me comment by saying that I think we had four very good presentations. And um, I particularly like Dr. James's focus, which is really kind of where my mind has been leading towards education, certainly in the last three to four years. It was quite interesting that in preparing for this, um, this presentation, I came across a publication, a 2019 publication about inclusive education in the Caribbean beyond 2020. It's edited by uh, Stacey Blackman and others. Uh, Stacey Blackman is from the KVL campus of the University of the West Indies. Now that publication speaks about education in a post-colonial era and the need for the kind of inclusive education model that is predicated on improving the quality of life index of the citizens, the vast majority of Caribbean citizens. It speaks about issues relating to human rights, about uh, economic opportunities, about social mobility. The problem with accessing that publication is that it is for sale. I came across a second publication, a 2013 publication, World Bank Report, and that spoke about improving the quality of regional education for the next generation. Now it tells us about the importance of accessing education at all levels, at the primary school level, the secondary school level, and how important it is for us to up the percentage of uh, secondary students who seek uh, tertiary education that figure somewhere in the region of about 15%. And certainly if we're really talking about serious development, that figure has to be much higher than that. And of course, all of this is linked to improving productivity and competitiveness. And what I found interesting in comparing and contrasting is that whilst we all agree, and certainly the uh, first publication never negate that fact, but whilst we all agree that we certainly need to provide more access to education at all levels, including the tertiary level, that the important point made by the first publication, but certainly not addressed by the World Bank's publication, is the need to ensure 
that the quality of our education impacts in a direct way the quality of life index in a direct way. And that has been borne out in research which has carried out quite recently about the importance of the quality of life index and its impact on economic growth. And what the research certainly done in India and other countries have shown is that that quality of life index have a far more profound impact on economic growth than the model of economic development being pursued by Caribbean countries over the last 40 to 50 years, which is to get more tourism, more agricultural development, etc. Um, that th there's a there's a lag in the translation of that into economic growth. And I think that is very evident when you look at the economic uh, growth rate. And certainly in Jamaica's case, in the last 30 to 40 years, we see an average of about 1% economic growth over the period. What it means, therefore, for me is that our education system, which has certainly been used to colonize us, has remained largely intact. And it has certainly not helped to reduce that dependency that we have on our international partners, as we call them, for advancing regional development. And certainly, I, I think that COVID-19 is even going to make that dependency far greater. So that our education system, certainly, if we look at that span post-independence, has certainly not caused us to advance significantly in terms of economic growth and significantly in terms of the quality of life index. That, that it hasn't done some improvements, we have seen some, but certainly there was need for exponential growth in both areas. What we, when we look at the curriculum, what we teach our children, and I came across it quite surprising. I saw in one curriculum, um, one of the syllabus teaching about rock formation. So rather than teaching about wealth creation, we're teaching our children about rock formation. The philosophies and opinion of Marcus Garvey, which sought to address the post-traumatic slave syndrome, which, which bedevils us over the last 500 years as part of, of, of a colonial legacy. That, that, op, that philosophy and opinion of Garvey, the Garveys in which we have been asking for the last 20 to 30 years to, be, for, to form part of the curriculum in our school from as early as early childhood education. We still cannot get our political leaders to have it implemented. And when you look at you know, some other countries who have made dramatic changes in a very short period of time in their educational curriculum, you wonder why it is that we are unable to make that transition um, into really decolonizing our education process so that it can begin to help us. We don't create a notion of wealth creation in our education system, but we end up depending on other countries, the savings of other countries to bail us out um, through loans and through our, our development programs. We don't instill a culture of productivity um, in, in, in our work, workforce. And so we end up invariably, certainly has been my experience in, in wage negotiations around bargaining table, where we, we, we huddle and get into a, a adversarial contentious debate about sharing, getting more from less. Um, we, we certainly have done nothing to improve the values and attitudes, the, 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 a sense of better sense of ourselves, um, improving our sensibilities towards the African heritage, our self worth, etc. So there's very little that our educational system has done to make that fundamental shift away from the inheritance of a colonial education model that was used primarily to keep us in check, but that we have adopted almost whole scale with minor tinkering and no whole scale revolutionary change. So we need to decolonize that education system. And then finally, with a quotation from, paraphrasing rather, from uh, Sylvia Winter, who really, to reinforce the point I made earlier, spoke about the European superstructure of civilization 
and the, 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 the pervasive cultural process that has been used largely to create a, a, a kind of an unconscious sense of our being. So, so, so we, we, we accept certainly what col the colonial teachings tell us as almost a natural unconscious, as she put it, unconscious spring of our being. And therefore, if we're going to really put development on a platform that, that benefits all of us, as the four previous speakers have spoken about, to get real development, economic growth and development, but, but to also get that sense of discipline so that people can observe COVID-19 restrictions, to get that sense of productivity improvement, to get that sense of decency, that sense of self-worth, we have to look at decolonizing our ed education system and putting it on the path for, for that kind of achievement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Roberts. Um, it is interesting that you made mention of something, uh, you, you made mention of history. And I could, I could remember that Dr. Jean himself also spoke about the whole idea of focusing on, you know, looking at rebranding and restructuring, especially focusing on fixing our curriculum, which I think is something that is much needed throughout the Caribbean, even though I know in many instances, and I know in Jamaica's um, in instance, I know there was some uh, reworking of the curricula in, in Jamaica and in Trinidad and Tobago that happened also in the primary school system during 2013. So I really want to say thank you very much for your contributions. And I would, we would of course have some questions for you at the end of this session. All right, so uh, Mr. Roberts, a uh, senior lecturer and head of the Hugh Shara Labor Studies Institute, open campus in Jamaica. All right, so I want to invite uh, Ms. Ms. Ramatali at this point in time, and Ms. Ramatali, who is a past president and the interim president of the National Parent Teachers Association of Trinidad and Tobago, to take the platform at this point in time. And Ms. Ramatali, I'm going to pose a question to you. All right, so, uh, you know, educators have always acknowledged the importance of parents in education. How do you see parents partnering with other stakeholders to ensure that the learning environment remains safe and equitable for all? So, Ms. Ramatali. Thank you so much. Yeah. First of all, I want to say by building relationships, you know, having shared goals, volunteering, training, and empowering of parents to know their rights and responsibilities. It is important for parents to understand that they have a role and a responsibility to their children and to be involved in the schools and not just leave the education of their children up to the teachers and principals. It, it, is, a, it is a pleasure to, and honor to briefly share our expectations for life post COVID-19 and to be part of this dynamic panel of speakers. The National PTA has been a strong advocate for parental involvement in schools and has played a significant role in many successful projects, which proves that parental involvement is critical for the success of their children. In light of this pandemic, and as we look at education 2020 and beyond, there must be a greater focus across the region on connecting, cooperating, empowering, and awakening excellence in our children. COVID-19 has presented us with fears and frustrations where all stakeholders are faced with unprecedented and uncharted situations. We may now have some communities spread as children who attended classes in preparation for the stressful SEA exam for entry into secondary school who were exposed to COVID-19 has changed the very landscape within which we exist we exist and has exposed the socio-economical, psychosocial, and disparate gaps between our low, middle, and high income members of society. From the parents' perspective, COVID-19 has left many of our students without access to teaching and learning. They had many opportunities to be taught by their teachers on various 
online platform. However, without students having access to a device or technology, education would be at a standstill. Many homes were not technologically equipped to support their children. While many teachers were not trained to use online platforms to ensure learning continues, how will the education system support parents to stay connected while there's a loss of earning, a lack of devices, a lack of skills to support their children? Many parents are struggling to fulfill their family's nutritional needs and to provide supervision for their children while working. However, COVID has given us the opportunity to chart a new normal for our education system. Let the conversation in the region begin on having an alternative to our placement examination for children at this young age. The question must be asked, can we find another formula for placing our children into secondary schools without a stressful level plus examination at present? Mm -hmm. And I must applaud the Barbados Prime Minister for starting the conversation and I hope that it is expanding. CXC is transitioning to e-testing and we must ensure that schools and our charges are prepared to make this transition. Even at tertiary level, students have been engaging in blended learning. Therefore, our system must be adjusted at an early stage to prepare children for digital learning. According to the publication entitled Rethink, Rethinking Education, and I had the opportunity to get this publication when I attended a, a session at the UN in 2017, entitled Towards a Global Common Good, and that was published by UNESCO in 2015. The world is changing and education must also change. Societies everywhere are undergoing deep transformation and the calls for new forms of education to foster the competencies that societies and economies need today and tomorrow. Another article in the Rethinking of Education says, is schooling really over? What we need is a more fluid approach to learning as a continuum in which schooling and formal education institutions interact more closely with other less formalized educational experiences from early childhood through life. Through communication with my regional colleagues, uh, regional body that we are trying to form to have a, a Caribbean PTA, it was reported that our education system must be redesigned to cater for blended learning and to ensure the system is made more equitable. We need curriculum reform ongoing training in the use of technology for both parents and teachers. We need trauma-sensitive classrooms, both virtual and physical, for social interaction with children. Recently, our Honorable Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Keith Rowley said, we need to build a digital nation by 2022. Therefore, if this is to become a reality, we need equal opportunities to provide education, and increase the economic growth and development of our nation. And I trust that as parents and teachers, as Caribbean people, we certainly will let the conversation be a fair one, be honest in what we would like to see for the future of our young people of the Caribbean. And I trust that as parents and teachers that we would be come involved with each other. We will build a greater bond. There will be greater collaboration and communication with our school population, all in the interest and the welfare of children of the Caribbean. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Ramatali. Uh, you said so many things within that little space of time. And one thing that just resonates with me at this point is that phrase you spoke about changing world changing education uh you know it's something for us to reflect on in terms of how are we really focused or hell-bent on changing how things are done especially you know um there's a little mantra that i use uh some persons say that you know everybody wants change but are you willing to yes, let's sir. think about that 
Yeah. So thank you again very much, Ms. Ramatali. I invite Mr. Osborne. Mr. Osborne is a current student and the president of the Cyril Potter College of Education in Guyana. And I invite Mr. Osborne to the platform. Mr. Osborne. Good evening, everyone. Firstly, first as I begin, I want us to understand that uh, education is a journey. And like was like it was beautifully put by the panelists before me that we're seeing as going forward, going to something as we're moving from the norm, which is the face-to-face -face modality, to a new norm, which is going to be the online aspect or the blended learning. So like Mr. Labari would have said, I am the president of the Sierra Potter College of Education Student Council. And the college, we have one main campus and 18 satellite centers across the 10 administrative regions of Guyana. Students enroll at the pre-service centers and the distance education centers. Some programs offered are the associate degree in education, the trained teacher certificates, and teacher upgrading certificates. The college offers programs for the pre-service, full-time students, they would normally attend from about eight, to about four or late in the afternoon. The modality of teaching is current, was currently the face-to-face -face, uh, delivery. Those centers are located mainly on the coastland of Guyana. While we have the distance education centers, where the part-time students would attend. Um, their modality of teaching, they have the blended modality of the print-based and the face-to-face -face delivery. The, those centers are located in the hinterland and riverine areas of Guyana. During the COVID-19 lockdown, um, my institution tested the scope of our online learning. We found challenges to include the limited or absence of the internet access, frustrating the frustration to use the online platform, especially where the connectivity was poor or absent. As I would have mentioned, most of the distance education centers are in the hinterlands and riverine areas. And some of those areas still are still to get uh, online access because of, their, um, because of the location of the villages and so on. They don't have the connectivity as we would have. Thus, taking into consideration Moving from the face to face modality or blended modality, we're moving towards something new, something exciting, something that is technologically advanced. So we're moving to a blended modality that would have a seldom or an occasional face to face interaction, depending on the infrastructure availability of uh, the school or what's not. Um, the context is a vital consideration when thinking about the education system 2020 and beyond. Different contexts may have different resources. While online delivery will work in some areas, in others, there might still be the need for the print-based delivery. As I would have mentioned earlier, the hinterlands are riverine area. They do not have the um, internet connectivity. Thus, we cannot say that we're going to have an online class put, put forward to them. We still have to have the print-based um, delivery for them. The blended delivery may mean preloaded materials and CDs, external hard drives, flash drives, and the use of radios. So in understanding now education 2020 and beyond, we need to now prepare the teachers for what is to come. Preparing the teachers for online classes, but considering their real situation. Prepare student teachers or teacher candidates to teach using online platforms, to design work for virtual space, assess online work, emphasize training in various areas needed to be prepared teacher for effective online experiences. Examples are the information technology, EDPM, graphic designs, videography. Training in online etiquette is also needed. Uh, as what would have mentioned, was mentioned by the student uh, panelists earlier, we see that students sometimes get, uh, they lose track of what is being said or what is being taught by the teacher during the online sessions. Thus, as uh, Gardner would have put forward in his theories in, a, in, in, in teaching a session, teachers must ensure that they 
have uh, most of the, the intelligence is in the lesson being taught so that they could capture a wider range of students. And so in preparing for 2020 and beyond, we need to prepare teachers with these different areas, have them understand what it is to teach on these online platforms. Some implications, however, for the teachers are making all experiences, regardless of the, the delivery board, enjoyable and fun, engaging the students online during the lesson, assessing student online work, ensuring all efforts are equitable. Again, the student would have mentioned that students may have some concerns of the credibility of their uh, work being scored and what's not on the online platform. And thus, this is something that teachers now have to deal with, how to prepare a solid proof, how to prepare a system that is uh, equitable, that it covers everybody, and ensuring that at the end of the day, when results are out or whatever is out, the student has a sense of fairness. And now to sustain or sustaining the experience, we need to keep preparing student teachers or teacher candidates to deliver education via online and blended modalities, require the schools to which these student teachers are attached for practicum or placed after graduation to have the necessary infrastructure to support the new delivery mode. The new delivery mode, again, as we would have mentioned throughout the discussions from the last five panelists, we're moving towards an online method mainly. And so we need to equip the teachers in using these different forms of uh, delivery. As seen here, we have the end mode of the Google, the Google Classroom and various other classrooms. All teachers need to understand and to have a sense of creativity when using either form of these delivery. Um, 2020 and beyond, this is what we need to prepare for. Teacher and student needs to be ready to take that step and understand that we all play a part in what is to come for education in the Caribbean 2020 and beyond. Uh, I must take time to say thank you to the president and members of the Caribbean Visionary Educators for giving me the chance to speak today. I also must thank uh, for answering any concerns that they would have had thus far and my principal also for being at my beck and call whenever I would have needed her assistance in preparing my presentation. I wish you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Osborne. We do appreciate your presence here with us this evening. And a few, a few points just to reinforce what you spoke about in terms of equipping teachers. And I want to add to, to equipping teachers, um, you know, to maximize the use of the online platforms. Persons um, may have the, have them available, but sometimes some persons may use them in not the best manner um, possible, especially for maximizing it for their students. All right, so I think we need to add that as well. And in terms of the blended learning, we know that there are challenges in some parts of the Caribbean. I know uh, in Guyana, as you said, in terms of the various regions, you may have those challenges, especially if you are trying to use an online platform for education. So thank you very much, Mr. Osborne. All right, we're moving right along. And I want to say thank you to all those persons who will continue to um, pose your questions. Remember to pose your questions in the question and answer section. All right, and those are the only questions along with those that are posted on Facebook will be the ones that we respond to at this point in time. I invite Mr. Kyle Maloney. Mr. Maloney is an entrepreneur. And Mr. Maloney, I am going to pose a question to you. So what are your thoughts on how we can create innovative learning environments at all levels of our education system to promote entrepreneurship? So Mr. Maloney, I give you the platform. All right. Having some difficulty with my video for some reason, as soon as they're ready to come back on. Is it blinking yes, we, for you we, as well? We are seeing you. We are seeing you. It's just, uh, oh, it's, it's fine. It's fine so far. All right, great. All right. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak here this evening. Uh, really interesting points uh, made by each of the panelists, definitely. Um, so to give a bit of context into me, 
um, before I uh, directly respond to the question. Uh, my name is Kyle Maloney, as uh, we've said, and uh, my background is a little bit like I did. I went to St. Mary's College, and then I went to do my undergrad in aerospace engineering. Uh, and from there, uh, I started my first company in university and realized then and there that um, I wanted to take on the approach of value creation through uh, creating companies that go after certain problems. And so, and so between the course of university in 2010 to 2020, the last decade of my life uh, since founded uh, six companies, uh, one of which we've sold, one failed, and uh, we have three up and running um, within the spaces of uh, technology convening, convening Tech Beach, um, uh, healthy food delivery, Chef Made, and uh, digital marketing, which is called First Digital. And so my context that led me to this outcome of uh, taking a problem solvers mindset and desiring to build companies uh, to go after and create solutions uh, for, for, for the wider audience and, and, and figure out how we can scale those solutions and, and impact, impact our wider world uh, came about because of a unique environment that I, I was born into. And then nurtured it largely through my secondary school experience, um, which I think both was in part by design and by luck. Uh, in uh, in Simmery's College, uniquely, we happen to have a lot of uh, entrepreneurial families. Um, in my in my year, we had like uh, founders of SM Jalil, his son. We had uh, like Beaver Construction, um, who his son now has Fat Boy Coconut Water. Um, we had basically like a number of entrepreneurs at various levels of our local society and being in that sort of climate and engaging in regular discussions about uh, their family businesses and analyzing other businesses and, and, and thinking about the world from a value creation perspective in that way uh, caused me, developed my mind to, to really see the world in terms, in those terms. Um, whilst uh, getting the traditional push from my parents, uh, most of my mom, to be like, go make sure you get your technical degree understanding so that you have a fallback plan, etc. Uh, the environment that I that that nurtured me socially, um, and, and and in the classroom, uh, really pushed me to to really think about the world in terms of in terms of the entrepreneurial mindset and that sort of thing. Um, and so how, how do we begin uh, having or, or replicating that sort of mindset in, class, in the classroom uh, more and more? I think, uh, I can't remember, uh, one of my uh, panelists initially mentioned, I believe it was uh, uh, Dr. James initially, where he was saying that, that, that uh, we are largely caught within a testing cycle and not thought, not taught how to how to problem solve, and I think that given given the context of the fact that that uh, we've really just adopted that colonial type education system, which was as uh, my, my my previous panelists, uh, I believe it was uh, Mr. Roberts identified that it was meant this system was largely meant to to keep us to keep us enslaved and going from our education system straight into a factory workers line and that education system has largely not evolved since then um, it doesn't it has not yielded as he said the outcome of of, of it, genuine emancipation of of people uh significant economic growth and general wealth creation of us the, largely the wealth creation has still managed to abound within our colonial masters and so, so the United Kingdom and the Scandinavian countries, et cetera, who have managed to far surpass the system that we currently still adopt and employ, uh, have continuously uh, 
developed and grown and led the charges in terms of economic, the economic indices on, on multiple, multiple levels. And so why, why is that? Why is it that, that after hundreds of years, we still manage to still be executing the same pattern, the same framework that was handed down to us? It's unfortunate, uh, despite it not producing the sort of results that we had wanted for us essentially to, to, to produce. Um, it still managed to be working for our colonial masters, whereby we still depend on, on them for, for loans, grants, and dependencies on them through World Bank, et cetera, and, and these mechanisms where the money still comes from uh, our, our colonial masters and that level of dependency still is there with us uh, on them. So uh, the impact of COVID-19, quite frankly, uh, education, I always tell my friends, education is one of the last industries to be disrupted. And this pandemic is definitely the disruptor of the education system, whereby we're seeing already where uh, top tier universities are still asking to charge top dollar for the education while still state while stating that your education is going to be delivered to you digitally and so now you're going to be seeing students re-rationalizing their need to actually go to university and for a large number of degrees uh, a lot of the education a lot of the information is, is widely available as well as these traditional education institutions are facing strong from a uh, new uh, entrance into the marketplace through the, through the forms of boot camps. Uh, I don't know if you guys may be familiar with some leaders in the space, like a company called General Assembly, um, or Udacity, or Udemy, or Khan Academy, and there's so much more. Like every year, there are more companies coming out with uh, this sort of like boot camp style, very focused, very short education programs that are very targeted towards solving or teaching someone a specific skill that they can then directly go implement on for themselves or then go into companies and be able to add significant value within the new digital economy. And their ability to be uh, nimble and uh, add new things to their curricula that the traditional education systems would take years to do because they follow a very, a very traditional sort of approach to to, to implementing changes to the, to the curricula. Um, these programs are becoming more appealing to, to my generation and the generation that's coming after me um, as they're able to, to learn quick learning go, uh, 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 acquire these new skills and be able to immediately go forward and add value to, uh, to, the, to these companies because the demand for these digital skills far surpass the supply that currently exists. And so, so what essentially, from my perspective, uh, we should be teaching in our schools uh, going forward? I think, I think quite frankly, the, the, the mold of what, of what we have previously done before should almost be, in some essences, teared up and, 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 and rethought you know, not tr stop trying to adapt and, and, and take pieces of before and, 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 and try to mold it into, in, into what you want it to be. Rip it up and start from scratch and realize that, realize that, that, that what got you here won't get you there. I think that's a saying by a guy called Daniel Goldman. Yeah. Um, uh, and, so, and so the reality is that so many of the jobs that, that the system before has been preparing us for will in reality no longer exist. So you are preparing students for a world that even doesn't even exist anymore. Even doesn't exist anymore. And so what we need to do is rethink what are the foundational things we need to be teaching students to become better humans, better individuals, better, better uh, contributors to their society, to their communities, to their world. Uh, and these skill sets are not, you, not, do not look like what we have, we have gone through and what we have developed to become, yeah? Um, the reality is that there's a, there's a new world of, 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 of jobs being created 
and it's to be created uh, that like I have conversations with my mom about this all the time. Like she could barely even wrap her mind around, around, <laughs> around a lot of these things. So for example, my young, one of my, one of my sisters, I have three young sisters, right? One of them uh, is, has been capitalizing on her, on her Instagram fame, right? Mm. Um, which is, which, which to, to my mother seems fickle, but my sister uh, is now working cons- consistently with a number of local brands, international brands, and they're sending her products, they're paying her for it. And she is finding a sense of, 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 of self-worth and pride in her ability to, 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 to appeal to a specific audience and segment and speak to them in a certain way and get that response and drive value for herself and for the brands. And so now, now we're seeing we're seeing the rise of what they call YouTubers, Fortniteers, Instagrammers. And these mm-hmm. people are, are, are extracting larger economic value from the marketplace than many of our professionals. Indeed, indeed. And um, especially with, with, with that, Mr. Maloney, I know, I, I know you have so, many to, so much things to contribute, but I really have to stop you. All right. Okay. And I mean, the, the conversation is going so good, but you know, we have, we have everything has to come, you know, abruptly to an end. So I do apologize, but I want to yeah, say yeah, thank yeah. you no problem, very no problem, much for no your problem. contribution. And, you know, especially when you spoke about the whole idea of trying to be independent. And I mean, I must compliment you as a young man for what you have done, you know, in terms of just reducing that dependency, focusing on just being your own boss, which I think uh, I, I take my, my hat off. Well, if I had a hat, I would have taken my hat off to you at this point in time. All right. So thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> so thank you very yeah. much. Um, just to quickly recap a few of the points that came up this afternoon, I heard Mr. Maloney saying things that are very similar to the other contributors this, this, this evening. Um, Mr. Roberts even spoke about the whole idea of focusing on history and the idea of decolonizi- decolonization, all right? The idea of reducing that dependency, very similar in terms of what the talk has been. And Mr. Amitali and Mr. Osborne also focused on the whole idea of blended learning and focusing on engaging students, having online platforms, as well as changing our world, changing education. So I pass you on to Dr. Freddie James at this point in time, and she's, she, I'm sure she has some questions waiting patiently for us. Yes, I do have some questions. I want to say, I, I thought that um, Dr. James was the radical in, in, in our midst, but I realized we have a few radicals in our midst. <laughs> Disrupting education and Gavianizing us and so on. So we have some very interesting questions for this second section of the panel. I will start off with a question to Ms. Ramatali from Andrea, which asks, um, with the suggestion that schools operate with rotation systems to ensure that social distancing takes place in the classrooms, how is this going to work? How are students at home going to be supervised? Are they going to be supplied with devices and internet access to ensure that their online lessons can continue? How can equity in the system be assured? Now, many questions, but the central thing is the, the system has been disrupted, as, as Kyle rightly says. And how are parents going to be fa- going to face this disruption and ensure an equity and ensure balance, uh, you know, within their homes and, and to ensure that their, their children get the education that they need? Before you jump into answering that, I'm going to pose the second question that came to you is, we want parents to be involved in the online learning scenario. How can parents be empowered to deal with the blended learning that is being proposed? So those two um, questions for Ms. Ramatali. I want to, to, to suggest, um, you know, over the years, a lot of times, you know, with no offense to anyone, this is plain talking today. Um, parents will be excluded from learning or involving them in courses that uh, you know many schools have for for 
teachers. I, I want to suggest that we create training modules, easy guides or videos for parents to understand how to use the platform. Enlighten them on their role in their, ch in their children's education, how they can learn and how they can support the teacher. So we must create that platform now where parents can be trained. Some years ago, we created a, a, a little booklet called a member's guide, where we spoke to parents in that member's guide, how to advocate for their children, how to communicate, how to approach a teacher when you, you visit the school, how to dress, those things. I think we also should have open lines of communication with parents. Sometimes parents are excluded, as I said before, for the learning process. So at this point in time, where we are looking at blended learning, we want to see the inclusion of parents in education. We, we no longer want to have parents come into the schools only to raise funds. This is, this is a new normal now. So parents must be involved in the education of the children. That is very, very important. For example, the physical school day has a structured timetable in place and parents can monitor students at the end of the day by their online, where they come online. Now, during this COVID period, teachers tried, they tried to, in many platforms, and there were parents at home and they didn't know how to help their children to, to be taught online. Then there are those who took their children, they thought it was a vacation, and they took their children to Tobago and on various outings and so on, whenever they, they could have. So the issue now is for parents to understand that they have a role and responsibility and how they must get involved. Um, the technology is there. Parents must not fear the technology. Principals and teachers also must reach out and keep the channel of communication open, keep those channels open, regardless of the educational level of parents. Many parents are afraid to, to say, look, I, I don't have a smartphone. I, I don't have internet access. So we have to create that scenario now where we can assist them to get involved. And this will take place also with our government ensuring that we are reaching out to the most vulnerable in our society, not leaving those children behind and parents who cannot afford a laptop at this point in time. So we have a lot to work on as a society and members across the region, because when I spoke with my regional colleagues from, from various um, Caribbean territories, they spoke about you know, those inequities in the education system. So we have to fill those gaps if we are to see a change at this point in time. Thank you very much, Ms. Ramal Matali, for those insightful thoughts and ideas. We move now to a question on quality, on, sorry, a question to Danny Roberts from Joanne. Um, Joanne says, um, brainwash education to make us the fool. Um, so many have been talking reform for so long, but no one seems to be listening. What would you say can be the singular most effective first step towards changing the system? I have a second question for you um, as well, which I'll throw out to you now. What will be the driving force or the determining factor that will force the powers that be to consider curriculum reform so that we will have a modern technologically competent education system that will produce consciously liberated, productive Caribbean citizenry. So, Mr. Roberts, I invite you to respond to those two questions, please. All right, thank, thank you very much. Okay. Part of the challenge that we have, we, we expect our leaders to take the initiative and to be able to make the changes. The fact that they have not made the change over the last 40 to 50 years is an indication that they have not 
fully emancipate themselves from the legacy of a colonial past. And it seems to me that, and when I listen to, to, to Kyle, that there's a younger generation that is coming up that holds no, have no inhibition to making changes, to revolutionizing, to redirecting things. But the, the, the challenge that I think that we're going to be facing in a globalized environment and that, that, that um, publication that I spoke of, the 2019 publication I spoke of made reference to the impact of globalization. What we don't want is a, a, a recreation of a Eurocentric approach to development, a, a Eurocentric model, a belief that because the developed world said so we must all go online, we are mimicking. We don't want to become mimic men. We have to create a development that is best suited for our experience. But if we don't begin to teach our children about our own history and an understanding of it, then you know we're, we're not going to get very far with that. And I don't know if the conditions determine consciousness. We, we may have to get worse before we get better. I mean, something dramatic may have to happen for us to realize that we need to, to, to make the change. You know, one of the interesting things, I went to the university in the 80s. And one of the interesting things is that um, a lot of the books and a lot of the, <coughs> the references that we relied on were written by Caribbean scholars. Today, when I look at some of the references and text, there are very few Caribbean scholars who are noted and cited. And so there, there certainly has been a shift from the 70s to the 80s to now where I think that the Caribbean development model has not kept pace with the, and Caribbean leaders for that matter, have not kept pace with the kind of changes that are necessary to bring us real independence. We, we have political independence, but we, we, our, our, our sovereignty, our, our sense of self, our recognition of our development model are all dictated by um, international partners. Um, we're bringing China now into the mix, um, all because we don't have a, a, a a culture of development, but of a model of development that is driven by Caribbean reality. And, and you know, it, 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 I have to rely, I've, I've, as Rex Stanford put it, you have to have hope in despair. I have to rely on the next generation to begin to make the kind of changes because certainly this generation has, would, would, would not get a passing grade. Thank you very much, Mr. Roberts. Very insightful. Again, Mr. Roberts is sending us back to challenge our historical antecedents. The next question I want to pose to Leon Dawson. And this question comes from Barbados. COVID-19 has forced institutions to turn to various digital technologies to ensure that teaching and learning continue. What measures do we need to establish to ensure that quality is not lost or compromised in our schools and in our teacher preparation institutions? Thank you very much, Ms. James. And um, to respond to that question, in order for the institution to not lose quality is, I mentioned this, that they just have to, it's training and training not, not, not only, it's, the training begins from top to bottom, administration, lectures, and students. Because an online, an online education system is not the same as a um, physical education system. So lecturers need to know how to properly present information to students. And that for, because if they don't know how to present information to students, the students will go to Google or be able to, you know, to another source that isn't as credible. So it's just all about training. So for it, in, in, in order for um, 
a, a, a school to not lose its credibility, its training. And that is one thing I can say that the UA Open Campus has because I've seen how um, my lectures, they bring across um, information to us. And these lectures are lectures that lectures for the UA Open Campus and for the um, London Campus. Thank it's you. only a bit of STEM. Sorry. That's enough? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, yes. Because I, I have a question to shoot to James. Okay, well. okay, no problem. We have a few questions for Kyle Maloney. Um, no so thank you very much for that, um, Mr. Dawson. You're Mr. Welcome. Osborne, many of us have been talking about government reform in the education system. What hinders educators from feeling empowered to create the change needed? Uh, well, very good question. Well, I believe, um, Dr. James, uh, the government plays a vital role in the curriculum. And again, based on how government would allow the teachers and the curriculum planners to go, they would now have a sense of how far they, 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 they the width or the depth in which they could go. And thus, if the government or the, the politicians and so on say that this is the amount we're willing to give and teachers are kind of restricted in a sense, and thus they cannot go as far as they would like, basically. Thank you very much, Mr. Osborne. Well said, and as educators, we all know the way to maintain quality is to establish a culture of quality in our schools and to ensure that we practice this um, culture of quality across the board. Students first make our, our lessons student-centered. Thanks a lot, Mr. Osborne. Now I have a few questions for Mr. Maloney. The first question um, from Norisi, Norisi, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. COVID has caused a transformation in many workspaces, making some jobs redundant. Jobs are not awaiting many of our graduates. How can we infuse the need for entrepreneurial training in all aspects of our curriculum? That's the first question. The next one is, how can we as a country, as a people relinquish what is embedded in us when the mature heads are stuck in their wheels? Kyle? I hear um, a video frozen. It's frozen for me. Yeah, it is frozen. It's frozen fast as well. All right. But we're hearing you, so you can go ahead. All right, yeah, no problem. All right, I could, I could start with the last one because <laughs> I think we all face that, 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 that issue of inertia. Um, but we can't lose hope. Uh, there's, this, there's this quote that I always, always say is that our futures cannot be a linear extrapolation of our pasts. And that is to say that, that I fight tooth and nail every day to ensure that, that where we're coming from doesn't look like where we're going. And where, where we're going looks drastically different positively from where we've come from. And the reality is that is that when you continue to put in the work over time, uh, over time the opportunities will be the preparation that, that you've been putting in place over that period of years. And it'll just be go time. It'll have no question about, about time to prepare. It'll, it'll just be, just go and, and, and you'll have that cross section between, between people feeling like overnight success, but you've been putting in that work over the years. And, and I was saying that to respond to the, to the, to the old, to the fact that you have the initiative from the mature heads is that, is that there will be a time when they transition, yeah? So you need to continue to put in the work now for the time when the transition takes place. And I'm already seeing the transition taking place within our current even political climate. For the first time, we're seeing uh, such a strong digital approach because it's being forced due to the pandemic uh, from both political parties. We know what happened with Cambridge Analytica thinking uh, five years ago. And then we're seeing like a new kind of marketing and a, a whole digital sort of presentation by, by, by the PNM this year in, in, in that way and the way that they're doing things. 
uh, and then they had the lime with a uh, uh, um, couple of youngsters and they spoke for a couple hours and that sort of thing and they take they, they're actively trying to engage youngsters and there's conversation about about digital the digital economy and actively uh developing digital economy these conversations uh uh might have been mentioned before but they're more actively being spoken about now and at some point in time that cross-section will occur that inertia will meet with those people that are pushing against that inertia and the wall will break down whatever met metaphor you want to utilize will occur and the progress will have to take place, yeah? And so, so someone like me is eternally optimistic and bullish on our future because uh, if not, then what? <laughs> if not, then what? Um, and so I continue to coalesce more persons, more young people like myself and more uh, more quote unquote older heads who, who get it and understand that that uh, where we are today and uh, where we want to be tomorrow, uh, the gap that exists and, and how aggressively we need to move to make that happen. Um, and so the first going to the first question, which was how can we employ the need for entrepreneurial training in schools? Um, I think that's happening already. Um, I think we just need to create the structure for for, for it to be a part of our regular ecosystem, our regular curriculum, sorry. For example, like when I was in, in when I did uh, uh, A-Levels Keep, um, I didn't have the opportunity to do entrepreneurship and innovation as a class. My young sister, she's, uh, she's 18, going to St. Joseph Convent and that's her Keep course, you know? Um, that was an option for me and she's actively taking that um, as a course in, in secondary school for Keep, you know? Um, and then uh, through, uh, through my organization, Tech Beach, we executed a, a kids coding camp called, uh, we call it Next Gen Coding Camp, where we expose kids to, uh, uh, to, to different coding languages, as well as uh, teaching them uh, the value and the importance of entrepreneurship and how to think about uh, their ideas and how to think about uh, solving the problems, et cetera. And a lot of these kids who already had their quote unquote hustles doing their things, you know? Um, and, and it was really cool to see that and really interesting and really amazing for us to be able to foster and develop and, and, and really spur on their thinking and, and, and drive confidence in them in the fact that they are thinking about it in the right way. They're seeing the world in, 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 in a positive way in that way and to continue to work on, on, on those solutions and continue tinkering until they find that sweet spot with something that they love and a solution that's valuable to, to the world. So I think it's happening. Thank you so much, Kyle, for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. No problem. On for the evening, yeah. listening to you and your ideas. <laughs> but of course, we do have more plain talk um, sessions to come, and we would have that opportunity. There were two questions we were not able to touch on um, because I have to, it's seven o'clock already, and I need to throw back to a host um, to wrap up the sessions. But I will just throw the questions out briefly we are our schools ready to allow students to bring their digital devices to classes to use as educational tools and um lms systems are lms are divers that's learning management systems are divers but will teachers be required to teach using employer approved platforms even if they are more familiar and comfortable with one that may not be. So those are two questions that we have thrown out and um, you certainly can go on our website, Caribbean Visionary Educators website and, and post your, your discussions based on those questions. I'm throwing back to our generous and our handsome host, and the syllabary. <laughs> thank you very much, Freddie. And I just want to say, as we wrap up, I want to say thank you very much to the persons who are present with us this evening. All right. Um, quickly from Dr. Vanus James, Miss Amanda Kamabach, Miss Jahi Aso, Mr. Leon Dawson, Mr. Danny Roberts, Miss Zina Ramatali, Mr. James Osborne, and Mr. Kyle Maloney, as well as our members on our Zoom and Facebook Live platforms. We really appreciate your presence here with us this evening during this two hour session. Imagine two hours has flown by and I didn't even feel it. So that's, 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 that's good, that's good.
All right. And also a special thank you to the 21st century educators for using for us using their platform this this evening for this session. All right. Please be sure to visit us once again in, um, in the not too distant future for another session of Plain Talk Education 2020 and beyond. So thank you very much to the CVE team, all those persons working behind the scenes, and of course, our viewing public. Thank you. Take care and God bless. Uh, thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much for having us. Have a great day, everyone. Yes, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Take care, thank everybody. Thank you for having us. Take care. Uh, thanks, Freddie. Thank thanks. You. Good job. Good job. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Good morning,